The aim of this vlog is to encourage reflection on practice, both individually and within your teams. How can we best use the resources and information available to promote and deliver safe practice? There are many areas where the prescribing red flags are well known and successfully managed. So how can we share best practice around this? At the same time, in the spirit of Professor Aidan Halligan, we must confront all problems to be able to overcome them. I've chosen two completely different areas to give a bit of variety. They are addiction, tolerance, and discontinuation of medicines. And secondly, drugs that are harmful in pregnancy, that is, teratogenic medicines. So let's look firstly at addiction, tolerance, and discontinuation of medicines and associated withdrawal symptoms. Confusion over these terms can lead to medicines adherence issues and prescribing problems. Patients may be concerned that a medicine is addictive when it isn't. Prescribers may be concerned that a patient is requesting a medicine that they won't take themselves. In other words, it's going to be diverted. I've also come across people who say they are addicted to antidepressants and are unable to come off them. Whilst this isn't addiction in technical terms, the discontinuation effects may be preventing a patient coming off a medicine that they don't need anymore. So having a full and open discussion about these issues in consultations is important. In addition, as the NICE guidelines on shared decision making and guidelines on adherence say, it's important to provide information before, during and after the consultation. Many commentators say that antidepressants can be prescribed unnecessarily. And my experience in patient-led medicines reviews is that many of us don't take them as prescribed or may even have stopped taking them but not told our prescriber, or indeed have never taken them. Very often, peer support can be an effective way to help patients reduce and stop antidepressants that aren't needed. In addition, there's a useful paper by the Royal College of Psychiatrists on stopping antidepressants. The principles, usually go slow and monitor, around reducing and stopping medicines can apply to other medicines, not just antidepressants. There are red flags here on withdrawal too. There have been many alerts and warnings around opiate prescribing and tapering, including this one from 2020. Prescribing for patients who are opiate naive is a red flag area. In addition, patients who have built up a tolerance to opiates can rapidly lose this tolerance. Having a clear picture of the recent dosage, including medication from all sources, is vital. Deaths due to too high a dose of an opiate being prescribed are not uncommon. Here's a question for reflection. What trusted information sources do you refer patients to when stopping or reducing medicines? An additional question, what other sources of information do patients refer to? Secondly, let's look at prescribing in pregnancy and medicines that can harm the fetus. There's been a lot of media attention and new alerts in relation to the risks of prescribing sodium valparate, brand name Epilim, in pregnancy. A recent headline said, for decades, pregnant women have been taking sodium valparate medicine, unaware of the risks. Here's what NICE say on the matter. Valparate is licensed for use in epilepsy and bipolar disorder, and it's also used off-label for depression, neuropathic pain, dementia and migraine. Women who take valparate during pregnancy are at significant risk of birth defects and persistent developmental disorders. If valparate is taken during pregnancy, up to 4 in 10 babies are at risk of developmental disorders and approximately 1 in 10 at risk of birth defects. So what's new? The MHRA has produced guidelines on prescribing valparate. They have changed their regulations to introduce a number of safety measures, including the recommendation that sodium valparate must no longer be prescribed to women and girls of childbearing age unless they're on a pregnancy prevention programme which is sometimes referred to as PREVENT. There's also a leaflet to give patients when prescribing valparate, and a new nice clinical knowledge summary on this, which is also included in the links section. My question for reflection here is, given that the information about valparate is not new, how much does shared decision making, or lack of it, play a role here? Taking us back to the vlog number one on shared decision making, this highlights for me the need to follow this guidance, including the need to share information before, during and after consultations, and the vital requirement of safety netting and provision of information in a format that the patient can understand. It also links to the Montgomery versus Lanarkshire case on informed consent. Also, how do we record prescribing decisions? Should we be recording consultations and offering this to the patients? This is mentioned in the latest NICE Shared Decision Making Guideline. Sharing information with patients is entering a new era, one of patient-led decision making. These issues around repeated errors and problems that just don't seem to go away 
crop up in, in other areas of prescribing practice? Is this something you should be discussing in your teams? Finally, for both the examples I've given, you may wish to consider to what extent has the advent of the prescribing competency framework improved prescribing practice? I looked for research papers on this question and could not find anything specifically covering the impact of the prescribing competency framework. Here's a blog I wrote on the RPS prescribing competency framework. I hope you found this useful and it provides materials for discussion and reflection. These, of course, can be used in your appraisals in peer reviews and for revalidation. You can find a template for reflection here.